Well, it is a small group, and this was my intent. Uh, by focusing on the hermetic corpus and alchemy, I've just gotten tired of talking about psychedelic drugs and always saying the same things over and over again. Nevertheless, it's a challenge to go outside my own bailiwick. I mean, I've had an interest in... Uh, Hermeticism and alchemy since I was about 14 and read Jung's Psychology and Alchemy. And it opened for me the fact of the existence of this vast literature, uh, a literature that is very little read or understood in the modern context. The Jungians have made much of it, but to their own purposes and uh, perhaps not always with a complete fidelity to the intent of the tradition. We'll talk a lot about the Jungian approach, but there are other approaches, uh, even uh, within the 20th century. Uh, I believe, since I don't have the catalog, I'm not absolutely certain, but I believe the catalog urged you to read Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition by Dame Frances Yates, and uh, this is, uh, uh, though Francis Yates' scholarship is very controversial, I think to get an overview of the landscape, her book is probably uh, the best single book between covers. It's not pleasing to some factions, and we can talk about that. I mean, we will probably discover within the group all the strains of alchemical illusion and delusion that have always driven the, uh, this particular intellectual engine. But I thought to get one book uh, uh, that sort of covered the territory, that was a good one to start with. Well, then I found out it's very hard to get this book. I didn't realize that because it's been sitting on my shelf for years. Richard Bird found a reprint at the Bodhi Tree that I wasn't aware of this particular edition. So, uh, though probably none of you brought it with you in a heavily underlined form, if after this weekend you want to try and get it, uh, it is available. And if you can't get that edition, why uh, a good book, search service can probably come up with the first edition which is Rutledge Keegan Paul I wouldn't hold a weekend like this simply to go over a body of ancient literature if I didn't think it had some efficacy or import for the modern dilemma and some of you may know the song by the Grateful Dead uh, in which the refrain is, we need a miracle every day. I think any reasonable person can conclude that the redemption of the world, if it's to be achieved, can only be achieved through magic. It's too late for science. It's too late for hortatory politics. Well, it's very interesting. I mean, every ancient literature has its apocalypsus. And in the Hermetic literature, uh, there is a prophecy. I think it's in book two, but that really doesn't matter. Uh, and the prophecy is that a day will come when men will no longer care for the earth. And at that day, the gods will depart and uh, everything will be thrown into primal chaos. And this prophecy was very strongly in the minds of the uh, strains of non-Christian thought that evolved at the close, the centuries of closure of the Roman Empire. When you look back into historical time, it's when you reach the first and second centuries after Christ that you reach a world whose psychology was very much like the psychology of our own time. It was a psychology of despair and exhaustion.
This is because um, Greek science, which had evolved under the aegis of uh, uh, Democritean atomism and Platonic metaphysics, had essentially come to a dead end in those centuries. We can debate the reasons why this happened. Uh, An obvious suggestion would be that it was because they failed to develop an experimental method. And so everything just dissolved into competing schools of philosophical speculation. And a profound pessimism spread through the Hellenistic world. And out of that pessimism and in the context of that kind of universal despair which attends the dissolution of great empires uh, a literature was created from the first to the fourth centuries after Christ which we call the hermetic corpus or in some cases the trismegistic hymns now this body of literature was misunderstood by later centuries, especially the Renaissance, because it was taken at face value and assumed to be at least contemporary with Moses, if not much older. So the the Renaissance view of Hermeticism was based on a tragic misunderstanding of the true antiquity of this material. And there are people, hopefully none in this room, who still would have us believe that this literature antedates uh, uh, the Mosaic law, that it is as old as dynastic Egypt. But this is an indefensible position from my point of view. In the early 16th century, two, uh, a father and son, Isaac and Marik Casabon, showed through the new science of philology that uh, this material was in fact late Hellenistic. Now I've always said that I am not a classicist in the Viconian sense in the sense that uh, there is a certain strain of thought that always wants to believe that the oldest stuff is the best stuff. This is not the case to my mind. To my mind, what is amazing is how recent everything is. So I have no sympathy with the fans of Lost Atlantis or any of that kind of malarkey because to me what is amazing is how it all is less than 10,000 years old. Anything older than 10,000 years puts us into the realm of an aceramic society relying on chipped flint for its primary technology. Um, What the... Hermetic corpus is is the most poetic and cleanly expressed outpouring of ancient knowledge that we possess, but it is it was reworked in the hands of these late Hellenistic peoples, and it is um, essentially a religion of the redemption of the earth through magic. It has great debt to a tradition called Sabian, which means to me Manichaeanism. And I'm sorry, Mandaeanism. And Mandaeanism was a a kind of proto-Hellenistic gnosis that laid great stress on the power of life, zoa, bios, And in that sense, it has a tremendously contemporary ring to it. We also are living in the twilight of a great empire. And I don't particularly mean the American empire. I mean the empire of European thinking created 
in the wake of the Protestant Reformation and the rise of modern industrialism, the empire, in short, of science. Science has exhausted itself and become mere techni. It's still able to perform its magical tricks, but it has no claim on a metaphysic with any meaning because the program of rational understanding that was pursued by science has pushed so deeply into the phenomenon of nature that the internal contradictions of the method are now exposed for all to see. And uh, in discussing alchemy especially, we will meet with the concept of the coincidentia oppositorum, the union of opposites. This is an idea that is completely alien to science. It's the idea that nothing can be understood unless it is simultaneously viewed as both being what it is and what it is not. And in alchemical symbolism, we will meet uh, again and again symbolic expression of the coincidentia oppositorum. It may be in the form of a hermaphrodite. It may be in the form of the union of soul and luna. It may be in the form of the union of mercury with lead or with sulfur. In other words, alchemical thinking is thinking that is always uh, antithetical always holds the possibility of, by a mere shift of perspective, its opposite premise will gain power and come into focus. I think it was John, when we went around the circle, mentioned his interest in shamanism. Uh, there's a wonderful book called The Forge and the Crucible by Merci Eliad, in which he shows that the shaman is the brother of the smith. The smith is the metallurgist, the worker in metals. And this is where alchemy has its roots. In a sense, alchemy is older than the trismegistic corpus, and then it is also given a new lease on life by the philosophical underpinnings which the Corpus Hermeticum provides it. Alchemy, uh, the word alchemy, can be traced back to mean Egypt or a blackening. And in its earliest strata, it probably refers to techniques of dyeing, meaning the coloring of cloth, and gilding of metals, and the forging and working of metal. I mean, we who take this for granted have no idea how mysterious and powerful this seemed to ancient people. And in fact, it would seem so to us if we had anything to do with it. I mean, how many of us are welders or casters of metal? It's a, it's a magical process to take, for instance, cinnabar, a red soft ore and by the mere act of heating it in a furnace it will sweat liquid mercury onto its surface well we have unconsciously imbibed the ontology of science where we have mind firmly separated out from the world we take this for granted. It's effortless because it's the ambiance of the civilization that we've been born into. But in an earlier age, and some writers would say a more naive age, but I wonder about that. But in an earlier age, mind and matter were seen to be alloyed together throughout nature so that the sweating of mercury out of cinnabar is not a material process. It's a process in which the mind and the observations of the metal worker maintain an important role. And let's talk for a moment about mercury because uh, the spirit Mercurius 
is almost the patron deity of alchemy. You all know what mercury looks like. It's a, at room temperature, a silvery liquid that flows. It's like a mirror. For the alchemists, and this is just a very short exercise in alchemical thinking, for the alchemists, mercury was mind itself in a sense and by tracing through the the uh, steps by which they reached that conclusion you can have a taste of what alchemical thinking was about mercury takes the form of its container if I pour mercury into a cup it takes the shape of the cup if I pour it into a test tube it takes the shape of a test tube this taking the shape of its container is a quality of mind and yet here it is present in a flowing silvery metal the other thing is uh, mercury is a reflecting surface you never see mercury what you see is the world that surrounds it which is perfectly reflected in its surface like a moving mirror you see and then if you've ever as a child I mean I have no idea how toxic this process is but I spent a lot of time as a child uh, hounding my grandfather for his hearing aid batteries which I would then smash with a hammer and get the mercury out and collect it in little bottles and carry it around with me well the wonderful thing about mercury is when you pour it out on a surface and it beads up then each bead of mercury becomes a little microcosm of the world and yet the mercury flows back together into a unity well as a child you see I didn't I had not yet imbibed the assumptions and the ontology of science I was functioning as an alchemist for me mercury was uh, this fascinating magical substance onto which I could project the contents of my mind and a child playing with mercury is an alchemist hard at work no doubt about it well so then uh, this is a phenomenon in the physical world and then mind is a phenomenon as in the Cartesian distinction which is between the res extensa and the res virens this is the great splitting of the world into two parts I remember Al Huang once said to me we were talking about the yin yang symbol and he said you know the interesting thing is not the yin or the yang the interesting thing is the S-shaped surface which runs between them. And that S-shaped surface is a river of alchemical mercury. Now where the alchemists saw this river of alchemical mercury is in uh, the boundary between waking and sleeping. There is a place, not quite sleeping, not quite waking, and there there flows this river of alchemical mercury where you can project the contents of the unconscious and you can read it back to yourself uh, this kind of thinking is confounding to scientific thought where the effort is always to fix everything into a given identity and a given set of uh, behaviors now the other a hermetic perception that is well illustrated by just thinking for a moment about mercury is the notion and this is central to all hermetic thinking of the microcosm and the macrocosm that somehow the great world the whole of the cosmos is reflected in the mystery of man of man meaning men and women it's reflected in the mystery of the human mind body interface so for an alchemist it makes perfect sense to extrapolate from these internal what we call internal psychological processes to external processes in the world that distinction doesn't exist for uh, 
for the alchemist and I tell you the longer I live the more convinced I am that this is just absolutely the truth our the myth of our society is the existential myth that we are cast into matter that we are lost in a universe that has no meaning for us that we must make our meaning this is what Sartre and all and Kierkegaard all those people are saying that we must make our meaning it, it reaches its most absurd expression in Sartre's statement that nature is mute I mean this is as far from alchemical thinking as you can possibly get because for the alchemist nature was a great book an open book to be read by putting nature through processes which revealed not only its inner mechanics but the inner mechanics of the artifacts the person working upon the material in other words uh, the alchemist well in other in other contexts I've talked about uh, the importance of language and how our world is made of language and part of the problem with understanding alchemy is that the language is slipping out of our reach we are so completely imbued with the Cartesian categories of the res virens the, the world of thought and the res extensa the world of three-dimensional space and causality and uh, uh, the conservation of matter and energy and so forth that in order to do more than carry out a kind of scholarship of alchemy we have to create an alchemical language or a field in which alchemical language can take place uh, some of you may have been with me a couple of weeks ago at uh, in Malibu when Joan Halifax and I debated uh, the roots of Buddhism and I think Joan deserves great credit for saying that Buddhism would never have taken root in America were it not for the psychedelic phenomenon not that Buddhism is psychedelic it in fact is fairly touchy about that but Buddhism would have gotten nowhere in America had not psychedelics created a context for Buddhist language to take root and I would wager that I would never have gotten to first base with proposing a weekend on alchemy at Esalen were it not understood that psychedelics have prepared people for the notion that mind and world can be poured together like mercury and sulfur like the sophic waters to create a new kind of understanding because otherwise modernity has fixed our minds in the categories of Cartesian rationalism and so uh, I will not claim and do not in fact think it's so that there was anything overtly psychedelic in the sense of pharmacologically based about alchemy uh, when we look back through the alchemical literature uh, there's very little evidence that it was uh, it was uh, uh, pharmacologically driven only when you get to the very last adumbrations of the alchemical impulse in someone like Paracelsus do you get the use of opium and uh, of, but it is interesting that the great drugs of modern society were accidentally discovered by alchemists in their researches a distilled alcohol is a product uh, of alchemical work and then as I mentioned opium uh, was very heavily used by the Paracelsian school but what they possessed was uh, an ability to liquefy their mental categories and then to project the contents of the mind onto these processes and read them back now this is what made alchemy so fascinating to the Jungian school 
because the Jungians were discovering the unconscious and they realized before the Jung's involvement with alchemy, the best material for uh, psychotherapy to work upon was dreams uh, but dream and mythology. And these were the two, uh, the two poles of the uh, data field that the discovery of the unconscious was working on. Well, then Jung had the prescience to realize that alchemy, which to that point, as the gentleman over here said, had been dismissed as a naive effort to turn base metals into gold, this is the first fiction that you have to absolutely purge from your mind. The only alchemists that ever tried to turn base metals into gold were charlatans, the so-called puffers, because they were called that not only for their exaggerated speech, but for their use of bellows to drive their fires. And alchemy has always had a core of true adepts and then a surround of misguided souls and uh, outright con artists who were trying to change uh, uh, base metals into gold. Now, it's interesting that science in its naivete in the 20th century has actually completed the program of pseudo-alchemy. Uh, you can, if you have a sufficiently powerful nuclear reactor, change lead into gold. I mean, the cost is staggering. It has no economic in importance whatsoever, but it can be done by bombarding gold with a sufficient amount of uh, heavy heavy particles, I mean, lead. You can change it into, into gold. But this is not... Uh, what the original intent was. In fact, when we look at the history of 20th century science, we will see that in a way it's a misunderstanding of what the alchemical goals were to be, and one by one it has done uh, these things that were uh, stated goals of the alchemists, except that the alchemists always spoke in similes and in a secret control language that was symbolic. Okay, uh, now another point that was brought up was, in going around the circle, was the externalization of the soul. And uh, what we're trying to do is in this weekend is study and talk about the idea of redeeming the world through magic and how is this to be done well the the philosopher's stone is a complex of ideas that no matter how you divide it no matter how you slice it it's very difficult to hold the pith essence of this concept but what it really comes down to is the idea that spirit is somehow resident in matter in a in a uh, very diffuse form, and that the goal of hermetic thinking and later alchemy is the concentration and redemption of this spirit, a focusing of it, a bringing of it together. This is an idea that was common in the Hellenistic world, not only to hermetic thinking, but also to Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the idea that somehow the pure, holy, real light of being was scattered through a universe of darkness and of... Uh, Saturnine power, and that the goal is by a process which we can call yogic or alchemical or meditative or moral slash ethical, the light must be gathered and concentrated in the body and then somehow released and redeemed. And all uh, 
esoteric traditions, East and West, talk about the creation of this body of light. And we will not, in this weekend, talk very much about alchemy, non-Western alchemy, Taoist alchemy and uh, Vedic alchemy. But uh, in those systems, too, the notion is about the creation of this vehicle of light. This is one metaphor for the externalization of the soul. The philosopher's stone is another And I will challenge you to try to imagine what the achievement of the Philosopher's Stone would be like because it's in trying to think that way that you begin to dissolve the categories of the Cartesian trap. And so imagine for a moment an object, a material, which can literally do anything. It can move across categorical boundaries with no difficulty whatsoever. So what do I mean? I mean that if you possessed the Philosopher's Stone and you were hungry, you could eat it. If you needed to go somewhere, you could spread it out and sit on it and it would take you there. If you needed a piece of information, It would become the equivalent of a computer screen and it would tell you things. If you needed a companion, it would talk to you. In other words, if you needed to take a shower, you would hold it over your head and water would pour out of it. Now you see, this is an impossibility. That's right. It's a coincidentia oppositorum. It is something which behaves like imagination, and matter without ever doing damage to the ontological status of of one or the other now we this sounds like you know pure pathology in a context of modern thinking because we expect things to stay still and be what they are and undergo the growth and degradation that is inimical to them But no, the redemption of spirit and matter means the exteriorization of the human soul and the interiorization of the human body so that it is an image freely commanded in the imagination. Imagination. I think this is the first time I've used this word this evening. The imagination is central to the alchemical opus because it is literally a process which goes on in the realm of the imagination taken to be a physical dimension and I think that uh, we cannot understand the history that lies ahead of us unless we think in terms of a journey into the imagination. We have exhausted the world of three-dimensional space. We are polluting it. We are overpopulating it. We are using it up. Somehow, the redemption of the human enterprise lies in the dimension of the imagination. And to do that, We have to transcend the categories that we inherit from a thousand years of uh, science and Christianity and rationalism, and we have to re-empower and re-encounter the mind. And we can do this psychedelically, we can do it yogically, or we can do it alchemically and hermetically. Now, there is present in the world at the moment, um, or at least I like to think so, an impulse which I have named the archaic revival. It's, uh, what happens is that whenever a society really gets in trouble, and you can use this in your own life, when you really get in trouble, what you should do is say, what, what did I believe in the last sane moment that I experienced? and then go back to that moment and act from it, even if you no longer believe it. Now, in the Renaissance, this happened. The the, uh, scholastic universe dissolved. Uh, 
new classes, new forms of wealth, new systems of navigation, new scientific tools made it impossible to maintain the fiction of the medieval cosmology. And there was a sense that the world was dissolving. Good alchemical word, dissolving. And in that moment, uh, the movers and shakers of that civilization reached backwards in time to the last sane moment they had ever known and they discovered that it was classical Greece and they invented classicism in the in the 15th and 16th century the texts which had lain in monasteries in Syria and Asia Minor forgotten and untranslated for centuries were brought to the Florentine Council by people like Gemistus Pletho and others and translated and classicism was born its laws its philosophy its aesthetics and we are the inheritors of that tradition but it is now once again exhausted and our cultural crisis is much greater it is global it is total it involves every man woman and child on this planet every bug bird and tree is caught up in the cultural crisis that we have engendered. Our ideas are exhausted, the ideas that we inherit out of Christianity and its half-brother science or its bastard child science. So what I'm suggesting is that an, an archaic revival needs to take place and it seems to be well in hand in the form of the revival of goddess worship and shamanism and partnership. But notice that these things are old, 10,000 years or more old. But there was an unbroken thread that however thinly drawn persists right up to the present. So the idea of this weekend is to show the way back to the uh, high magic of the late Paleolithic to show that there were intellectual traditions, there were minority points of view that kept the faith, that never allowed it to die. And to my mind, this alchemical, hermetic, Gnostic, Egyptian... Chaldean thread is the thread and if we uh, you know unravel it with sufficient care and attention then we can build a bridge from the otherwise nearly incomprehensible high magic of the late Paleolithic we can get it as near to ourselves as John Dee who died in 1604, we can discover that it's no further away from us than the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. And, uh, you know, for my money, after that, it gets pretty mucked up. I mean, after Eliaphas Levy, who's already waffling, I'm not very interested in the, in the occultism of the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. But it's not necessary because scholarship gives us the Chaldean oracles, the Trismegistic hymns, uh, the library at Nag Hammadi, um, and so forth and so on. So uh, I, my impulse is to, in the most austere sense, repopularize, reintroduce this kind of thinking so that people can live it out. And then, step by step, we can evolve our language and evolve our understanding to make our way back to the garden, back to Eden. It's occurred to me recently, you know, it's said that Christ opened the doors to paradise. Yes, but he closed the doors to Eden. And paradise is a very airy place where everybody sits around on clouds strumming their lyres. I think what we want to do is make our way back to the alchemical garden. That's where our roots are. That's where meaning is. Meaning lies in the confrontation of contradiction. 
the coincidencia oppositorum. That's what we really feel, not these rational schemas that are constantly beating us over the head with the thou shalts and thou shoulds, but rather a recovery of the real ambiguity of being, an ability to see ourselves as at once powerful and weak, noble and ignoble, future-oriented, past-facing. We each need to become Janus-faced and to incorporate into ourselves the banished contradictions of being that so haunt the uh, enterprise of science. We can leave that behind, and when we do, we reclaim authentic being. And authentic being, make no mistake about it, is what alchemical gold really is. That's what they're talking about. Authentic being. So that's uh, tonight. Right now what? We're led. We're led. We're Saturnine. And we'll talk about Saturn and uh, Pluto and all of that. Yes, we... uh, Tomorrow we'll talk about the stages of the alchemical opus... And though the stages are many and multiferous, it all begins in what is called the negredo, the blackening, the depths of the leaden, saturnine, chaotic, fixed place. And that's where we have been left by science and modernity and so forth and so on. And that's where, that's where the alchemist loves to begin, That's where he then stokes, he or she stokes the furnace and begins the dissolutio et coagulatio that leads to the uh, appearance of the stone. (coughs)